are gonna, um, uh, you know, let me just check one more thing before I go. Yes, we, uh, I know we're like to, I think we're all fine. So, um, so let me, uh, First of all, thank uh, the four panelists for coming and thank you all for participating. Uh, you know, also the, you know, uh, significantly large audience that registered and that might be following us on YouTube for, for coming. Uh, the topic of our roundtable is, as you know, uh, the new IMF and um, the um, and the current crisis, you know, um, and uh, we uh, are essentially going to discuss uh, you know, the, the role of, uh, of the IMF and how the IMF has changed uh, throughout history. And, and you know, uh, it's worth remembering very briefly, I won't take the time uh, of the uh, four panelists, uh, that the IMF uh, has uh, obviously changed views over time. It was formally designed by uh, uh, Harry Dexter White, the sort of winning uh, plan, and John Maynard Keynes, um, to, to some extent, because there was a consensus on the idea that uh, volatile capital flows uh, were a problem. Uh, and it had the power at the beginning to restrict capital flows and it did uh, uh, to promote those, uh, provided they didn't affect uh, the, the current account transactions. Um, uh, and, and I should say, from a formal point of view, actually, the IMF was never uh, in favor of capital account liberalization, although that was discussed during the 90s, but that was probably derailed by the uh, Asian financial crisis. Um, and, uh, and, and the same can be said about the other pillar of, of the uh, IMF, uh, which you know, it's normally associated uh, to, um, to, you know, because of its foundation to Keynesian policies uh, that uh, it, it you know uh, the, the views on, on on fiscal policy that were uh, from the beginning, I would say, uh, more conservative that one would uh, sort of uh, you know associate with Keynesian ideas. And you know, I have here the sort of old book by uh, uh, Jack Pollock, uh, you know, who was uh, the first effective um, um, chief economist uh, at the IMF. Uh, that the, the uh, IMF, uh, you know, was uh, fundamentally, uh, you know, if you look at uh, at least formally, not against, uh, you know, fiscal policies in, in, in times of crisis, uh, but, um, you know, perhaps reflecting Keynes' ambiguity uh, too, uh, you know, it's worth remembering that Keynes was for, for uh, deficits not on a permanent basis, uh, he differentiated between the current and the capital, uh, you know, budgets, um, and, and there might be a debate on, on, on uh, how he saw those things. But, you know, the IMF, as uh, James Bottom uh, uh, sort of uh, suggested, uh, w was always uh, more than the World Bank and other uh, international institutions, um, less open to dissent um, and more keen to follow what he calls best practices uh, in the profession, meaning the mainstream. But it's clear, I think, that uh, Baron is correct in emphasizing that there is a break in the 1970s. It's at that period that the IMF becomes more decisively more relevant in the programs of adjustment in developing countries. Uh, although Argentina, and we'll talk about Argentina, you know, had programs way before that. Um, but those become more relevant and the conditionality structure sort of appears at the time that we have the rise of neoliberal policies. So uh, that inflection, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, is uh, historically important and brings us to the question of whether we have had, with the last two important global crises, the, um, the, um, the uh, Great Recession and now the Great Shutdown or, or the COVID crisis, whatever you want to call it, a new inflection point. So uh, uh, Gita Gopinath, the current uh, chief economist has said that the IMF rather than waiting for crisis has to, um, uh, should provide forward guidance and act uh, before they, uh, they uh, sort of developed. So to discuss those issues, the issues of whether the IMF ha has uh, changed, the issues of whether the IMF uh, is not your grandparents' uh, IMF, to use Eileen's uh, sort of apt phrase about that. 
uh, we have a distinguished panel. So we will, uh, I will briefly present them. We have um, Professor Eileen Grebel. She's a distinguished uh, university professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. Her latest, she has many publications. I'm pretty sure that you all know her very well. Her latest book is uh, When Things Don't Fall Apart by MIT Press. If you didn't buy it, go immediately and buy two copies. And uh, so uh, uh, Eileen, uh, you know, uh, will have to leave uh, because she has uh, a department meeting, a Zoom meeting, uh, another Zoom meeting, uh, which perhaps could have been an email. And, uh, and so uh, she apologized beforehand, uh, uh, but we are lucky to have her. We also have Marc Lavoie. Uh, he is uh, an emeritus professor now, which is uh, sort of frightening to me because it does uh, say something about my age too. Uh, the, and Marc is an emeritus professor, both at the University of Ottawa and uh, at the uh, University of uh, Paris, Paris Nord. Um, I won't attempt uh, my, my French on you guys. Um, and, and he is also a, a very well-known uh, post keynesian economist. He has at least two books that I want to emphasize here. He's uh, co-written co book with Wynne Godley, uh, Monetary Economics, and a very influential uh, manual on post keynesian economics, uh, you know, the foundations of post keynesian economics, uh, and there are more than one edition of that, uh, of that particular book. Um, and uh, he has done also research on, on, uh, on the changes on the IMF. And so we're lucky that uh, we'll have him too. We also have Esteban Perez Cadente, who is uh, an old co-author and he's an economist at the uh, United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, he's there, the chief of financing for development uh, um, unit. And he has recently published an intellectual biography of Roy Harrod. Uh, which uh, I should have said also go buy Mark's books too. Uh, and uh, you should go buy uh, Roy Harrod's uh, you know, biography. It's a neglected sort of author relevant for a lot of the things that we're gonna discuss here. It's in the Great Thinkers in Economics collection uh, published by Paul Grave, uh, edited by Anthony Thurwell. And finally we have uh, from Argentina, although she's coming uh, from Italy, uh, and Florencia Sember. Florencia Sember is at CONICET, the Argentinian, um, you know, uh, um, uh, research sort of uh, uh, government, federal government institution and the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, she is a specialist on economic history and history of ideas. Um, and uh, she co-edited, uh, you know, also recently uh, a book that if you translate literally was published in Argentina, it's the necessary history of the Central Bank of Argentina uh, with Marcelo Rouget, uh, which if you uh, speak Spanish, you should also go by. Uh, that one, I should say, has a chapter that she co-wrote uh, with me beside other two chapters that she wrote uh, in, in the book. So uh, without further ado, what I, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go by the order uh, that I just presented them. I'm gonna give them 15 uh, minutes and I'm gonna um, you know, try to sort of signal uh, when we are at five and one minute I will, uh, you know, if not, I will unmute myself and, uh, you know, uh, give you a reminder. Uh, and I also um, should say that if you want to post questions to the chat, by all means, uh, we will at the end, uh, you know, have a you know, series of uh, questions and, and answers. So it will be open for that. Okay, Eileen, please. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Matthias, for organizing this um, and for inviting me. And it's wonderful to see so many old friends um, and students here. Um, and again, apologies in advance for the fact that I'll have to leave the webinar earlier than I'd like. Uh, but let me just get down to things. Um, what I'd like to do is enlarge the lens of the panel a little bit by reflecting on the IMF's role in global macroeconomic governance. Um, the comments that I want to make are very much grounded in the view that global macroeconomic governance has long been deeply deficient. These deficiencies are revealed and amplified by the COVID crisis, and the task of radically rebuilding the broken global economic governance architecture, I think, is all the more pressing um, for a number of reasons. The first is the scale, speed, and global reach of the COVID crisis. 
The second is the fact that the crisis emerged in the historical context of unprecedented inequality, which meant that the long recent period of economic growth failed to improve the well being and the life chances of so many around the globe. And on top of this, the climate crisis presents an existential threat. Um, while the foundations of post-war multilateralism have been challenged by reactionary political movements in a number of national contexts, a trend that hopefully is reversing in some manner in the Biden-Harris era. Now, with all of that said, what I'd like to do in the time that I have is outline a number of directions for global macroeconomic governance, several of which involve the IMF, um, together, I think they could provide an enabling environment for a more inclusive, pro-poor, green, feminist, and anti-racist response to the COVID crisis. Um, and my primary objective is really to speak to the overarching progressive pursuit of harmonized governance to replace global neoliberalism. Um, and let me just explain what's involved, and then I'll turn to some specific um, policy matters. I think it's essential that reconstructed permissive multilateralisms maximize policy space for experimentation and innovation with strategies that uplift and amplify the conditions of life for the global poor, women, promote economic and social well being, inclusion, resilience, shared prosperity, sustainability, and recovery from the economic and the public health costs of the COVID crisis. Now I argue for per permissive multilateralisms, plural, not singular, as an alternative to nostalgia for a unified, harmonized global governance system. In my view, harmonization is too close a cousin to earlier calls for what I've referred to in some of my work as a totalizing search for coherence, which in practice has meant restrictive, autonomy constraining, neoliberal, corporate and elite led multilateralism. Recall that the multilateralism of the post-World War II era was fairly messy, but in a good way. It was permissive and provided space for cross-national domestic policy heterogeneity. And indeed the agreement to disagree on matters of domestic policy was really hardwired into the system through article four of the newly created IMF. Permissive multilateralisms may have a chance if, as I hope and I know all of us do, that the Biden-Harris administration in the US marks a renewal of global engagement by the country's leadership. This would be a corrective to the naked self-interested nationalism of the last four years. And it would represent an acceptance of what is obviously true, namely that enduring deep challenges in the arena of public health, climate, and the economy, including rampant inequality, cannot be addressed without robust, permissive multilateral cooperation supported by well-resourced, legitimate, inclusive institutions of global economic governance. The Biden administration is signaling a cooperative spirit and a global outlook. Let's hope that this plays out in practice, but with a much greater skepticism than previous administrations have had about the supposed virtues of liberalized globalization. And I think let's also hope that the administration's fragile compromise with progressive forces within the US helps to insulate a Biden-Harris administration from capture by the private sector. Speaking pragmatically, permissive multilateralisms may be all that's feasible for a public that has little appetite for grand plans in what I've termed in a recent paper, an ismless post-American moment. And separate from what happens in the US, multilateralism has and is being contested and reshaped by other actors, most notably China. This means that multilateralism's 3.0 will be different from the singular unipolar multilateralism of the post-war and the neoliberal eras. Institutions uh, within the UN system and civil society organizations, I think have a critically important role to play in advocating for a renewed permissive multilateralisms. And since I've used the term permissive several times already, let me say a word about it. By permissive, I mean simply regimes that promote genuine policy autonomy at the national and subnational levels. A permissive regime promotes opportunities for widespread policy experimentation. 
experiments, not top-down harmonized policy blueprints. I think we're all in favor of restrictive regimes on the condition that we are the ones who get to write the restrictions. In a second best world, we are not, where we're not in the position to write the rules, we should accept that permissiveness is a virtue we should seek, and then we should look to exploit the policy space that such a regime creates to achieve our deepest social objectives. Um, and so let me now just turn to some pressing policy issues that are really consistent with my emphasis on policy autonomy and in which I highlight the role of the IMF and other multilateral actors. I think chief on the sovereign debt agenda is the pressing need for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, what we can call an SDRM, something that's been raised and abandoned over several decades. It's certainly the case that widespread lasting debt crises in the global south and the global east will be what one lasting legacy of the COVID crisis, promising yet another la uh, lost decade. And indeed, there's there have already been six defaults um, in 2020, Argentina, Ecuador, Belize, Lebanon, Suriname, and Zambia. Many actors such as UNCTAD and civil society organizations have developed frameworks and advocated for an SDRM architecture, which should be placed under the UN. Uh, under the UN, IMF officials have identified the need for an SDRM, as have World Bank officials in the past. Implementing an SDRM is a matter of political will. I think the private sector has to be forced to the table on this matter. Um, now that the naive fantasy of voluntary private sector compliance has been recognized as such by the Bretton Woods institutions and by the G20. I think a quid pro quo approach seems like a good lever to force the private sector to the table once its representatives queue up for a new handout as the COVID crisis continues to unfold. And certainly in addition to an SDRM, comprehensive debt relief, that is haircuts involving public and private sector obligations and debt cancellations for the poorest countries are essential. Without it, we can sign these countries to more austerity and nothing could be more harmful to an inclusive, pro-poor, feminist and green agenda. Debt standstills, such as the G20's Debt Service Suspension Initiative, the DSSI, only kick the can down the road. And even the G20 recognized the failure of the DSSI and replaced it in November 2020 with another deficient program, the Common Framework for Debt Treatments Beyond the DSSI. Um, and I'll just note that the common framework requires participants to be under an IMF program. And just to repeat, comprehensive debt relief should be a much higher priority. Um, without debt relief, policy autonomy retains, remains unachievable, regardless of other features of global governance regimes. Another point that I'd like to make is that the failed performance and the compromised business models of credit rating agencies were apparent well before the COVID crisis. But the threat of a downgrade or of being placed on negative outlook prevented many countries from taking advantage even of the G20's DSSI, inadequate as it was. In November 2020, more than 60 countries were downgraded and around 31 were put on negative outlooks reconstituting credit rating agencies so they function like public utilities, I think would go some distance in reducing the monopoly power and their ability to constrain policy space in times of crisis. Uh, turning to the matter of capital controls, which Matthias already flagged, um, they are, of course, a tool for expanding policy space for experimentation, especially space for accommodative and expansionary macroeconomic policies. They were a key feature of the post-war economic architecture. They fell out of favor during the no long neoliberal era. And as the crisis of 2008 emerged, and as I've written a good bit about this matter, capital controls were quickly re-legitimized, even by the IMF in the form of what it's called the institutional view. The IMF's institutional view should be clarified, in my view, and made less equivocal in ways that maximize policy space around this instrument. A more expansive institutional view should unequivocally involve support for controls on inflows and outflows, should see controls not as a last resort, but rather as a permanent and dynamic part of broader prudential counter-cyclical policy toolkits to be deployed as internal and external conditions warrant. 
and should reflect the view that controls may need to be blunt, comprehensive, significant, lasting, and discriminatory, rather than modest, narrowly targeted, and tempor temporary. And so any global governance regime that seeks to develop a framework for capital controls, I think should err on the side of generality, flexibility, permissiveness, and should promote cooperation by both capital source and recipient countries, and should embody an even-handed acknowledgement that monetary policies like capital controls have both positive and negative global spillover effects that necessitate, necessitate some type of burden sharing. Um, and capital control should be understood as part of a broader program to rein in the power of domestic and international finance and rebalance the world economy in ways that move it from its present K-shaped pattern in which finance flourishes and the rest of the economy and the population stagnates or suffers. Now, just Five turning, minutes, Eileen. Sure, perfect. Uh, the response of the Bretton Woods institutions to the economic and public health challenges of the COVID crisis has been deeply disappointing, despite IMF managing director uh, calls for all hands on deck uh, starting in April 2020. Um, dispersals has been, have been slow and small relative to vast needs. Emergency financing for immediate relief is overdue. Um, most analysts and civil society actors have advocated for the release of $500 billion in SDRs to support emergency financing. The Trump administration vetoed this initiative. Um, I think it's surely a priority or should be a priority for Treasury Secretary Yellen to endorse a new SDR allocation, either the original proposal for $500 billion of SDRs or better yet, as Jayati Ghosh recently argued, for US $2 trillion in SDRs. Notably, even Larry Summers has called um, increased SDR issuance a no-brainer. Now, more broadly and beyond the imperatives of a COVID era response, the Bretton Woods institutions need to be better and more stably resourced. The IMF's new catastrophic containment and relief trust, which did provide some debt relief for low-income countries, was financed through IMF fundraising from private donors. This really underscores the institution's constrained resources. The institution also, of course, needs to regain legitimacy, be modernized, leadership selection practices should be transparent, merit-based and inclusive, steps should be taken to increase the voice and vote of countries in the global south and the global east, and the institutions need to become more responsive and accountable to a broader range of stakeholders. Um, I would also note um, that I've argued elsewhere that a more densely populated, messy global financial governance architecture is more likely to be tolerant or supportive of experimentation and a diversity of economic models and approaches. That kind of permissiveness is absent under an architectural monoculture that exerts a gravitational pull towards a single idealized model. And so speaking practically, this means enhancing the flow of resources to financial institutions in the global Global South and the Global East, expanding connections among them, as has been happening since 2008, and advancing rules of engagement and backstop financing between these institutions and the Bretton Woods institutions, provided that these connections do not compromise policy autonomy. Um, I would also note um, that it is critically important to underscore the enduring importance of access to public finance and official development assistance that is essential to any successful plan for sustainability and social justice and COVID era recovery. Um, last point that I would make, um, it's, we must move beyond tired rhetorics to expand and protect policy space for accommodative macroeconomic policies. Some central banks and some governments in the global north unveiled assertive and often creative macroeconomic policy responses to the COVID crisis. Budget hawks in many contexts even made a case for what they call giant bazookas uh, to spend into the COVID crisis. The US Fed has adopted an average rather than a single point inflation target. Um, but of course, there have been very mixed messages from Bretton Woods officials who have told policymakers in the global South and East to fight the COVID war with spending, but to quote, keep receipts. 
Um, and I've argued that the IMF in recent work can be described as incoherent. That incoherence is evidence in some encouraging changes on the matter of capital controls alongside deeply disappointing resilience of old strategies in others, such as continued promotion of austerity and negotiations with Costa Rica, for example, uh, the pressure for central bank independence in the recent agreement with Ecuador, and the gap between research and policy at the IMF. I think it's interesting to see that in January 2021, uh, the IMF's head of fiscal policy called for rethinking of public finance rules. He argued that wealthy countries should learn to live with higher public deficits in the era of ultra low interest rates, which should be helpful to the Biden administration and the EU. He also called for those countries in the global South and East with fiscal headroom to do so as well. The obvious point, which was acknowledged by the IMF, is that this is completely irrelevant uh, for the poorest countries. Um, and so I'll just close by saying that the challenges of enabling a pro-poor, feminist, green, just, and anti-racist COVID-era recovery plan calls for vast, globally inclusive programs of public investment in public health, care economies, green transformations, support for universal social protections and universal basic incomes, employment generating activities, education, and digital access, among other things. Fiscal space for these initiatives was not available in many countries of the global South and East prior to the COVID crisis. It's obviously a much bigger challenge at the present time. And so I think it's really important for economists and civil society actors to make a case for accommodative macroeconomic policy frameworks now and after the COVID crisis is controlled and to challenge the myths peddled by austerity and inflation hawks as they reassert themselves in a post-COVID environment. Um, and in that context, again, I would reiterate that haircuts on debt are of crucial importance, um, as are other matters that many people at the webinar have written and spoken about, such as addressing tax evasion by domestic and multinational firms and the world's super wealthy, curbing illicit capital flows, um, all as ways of increasing the opportunities for resource mobilization in order to support progressive aims. Uh, thank you. Stop there. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, so we now move to uh, Mark Lavoie. I'll ask if you have questions, you know, please uh, add them to, to the chat. You should be able to do that. I also want to add before Mark starts that uh, Mark will um, be uh, given the uh, Godley Tobin Lecture at the Eastern Economic Association. Mm -hmm. February, uh, I will uh, post more information about uh, about that, uh, um, you know, uh, pretty soon. Okay, so so uh, Mark, please, I, I'll also give you a, a five minute and a one minute uh, sort of uh, warning. Uh, can you see the the slide? Mm -hmm. um, I, I had it for a while now. It you know it says that you're sharing the screen, but. Uh, Oh yeah, I can see it. Right. Uh, so um, Eileen um, especially talked about uh, for, uh, had a forward looking approach to the question that you put to us. Um, in my case, it's more backward, uh, backward looking. And uh, I will also talk more about macroeconomic theory at the IMF and also the fiscal policy that was advocated. Um, one, one can argue that uh, at least looking backward uh, around the, the financial crisis and afterwards, one can see that, say that there are four views of the IMF stand. The first one is the continuity thesis, little has changed, so that's uh, you, Matthias, and your former student. Uh, then there's the U-turn thesis, which is the one that uh, Brett Fiebiger and myself argued in 2017, uh, which is the basic uh, basis of, on what I will be talking about. Uh, the third view is the one by Eileen, which she expressed at the very end of, of her presentation which was that there are internal policy debates and therefore some contradictions in the way the IMF present things. And then 
there's a fourth view by uh, Ben Clift, which was published in the Review of International Political Economy, which says that it's the IMF that led the way towards uh, Keynesian policies. Um, so I will only mainly talk about the U-turn thesis and I'll have one slide about uh, what Ben Clift was uh, claiming. So the, the U-turn thesis is what uh, Mario Sakarecha, my colleague from the University of Ottawa has called new fiscalism. Uh, before 2008, well, it was the new consensus. Uh, the, 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 everything must be done through the central bank. The government is not important. Uh, in the way that the government must simply balance uh, its uh, budget. But this all changed in 2018. And uh, well, 2018, 2008, sorry, 2008, 2009, uh, the IMF uh, said, okay, uh, we should have a lot of uh, short dose fiscal stimulus. Uh, so it was neither sound finance nor functional finance. And uh, there was uh, many, uh, very often the word fiscal space was being used, although it was never defined very clearly. Um, so that was the view uh, in 2008-2009, uh, but then uh, everything changed. Uh, so Prakash Longani from the IMF Independent Evaluation Office calls it the new austerity. And uh, in 2010-2011, uh, for instance, the IMF was saying most advanced economies should embark on fiscal consolidation in 2011. Uh, the urgency is greater and consolidation needs to begin now. So there were maybe not a complete U-turn, but there was uh, quite a change in what was being argued just a year before. Uh, the key message was that uh, fiscal strategies should aim at reducing public debt ratios rather than just stabilizing them, and failing to do so would ultimately weaken the world's long-term growth prospects. And uh, this was uh, justified by modeling. Uh, for instance, just as an example, there is this paper by Clinton, Kumhoff, Laxton. Those two, Kumhoff and Laxton, were important people, I believe, at the IMF. And uh, they argued that uh, with their new global DSG model, uh, they could say that over the long run, well targeted permanent reductions in budget deficits would lead to a considerable increase in both the growth rate and the level of output. So uh, they were proud to say, and I'll come back to this uh, towards the end, they were proud to say that their model had both Ricardian and non-Ricardian consumers so that their model was not just new classical model uh, they had liquidity constraints for the non-Ricardian consumers. Uh, but despite that, um, you know, to make, uh, despite that, higher government debt would uh, make things more contractionary in the long run due to some crowding out effects due to higher real interest rates. So well, that was the justification for this new austerity view that happened in 2010, 2011. And then was the famous uh, box by uh, Blanchard. Uh, and, and then they uh, expanded this in 2013 uh, when Blanchard and his colleague argued that it seems safe for the time being when thinking about fiscal consolidation to assume higher multipliers than before the crisis. Uh, and so, well, as we know, there were, I mean, there, was, there were big disagreements between uh, the views being handled uh, by the ECB and people within the Eurozone uh, 
in contrast to the views that the IMF was pushing for. Uh, they were claiming then, the IMF, that the weakness of private demand in the euro area also suggests that countries that have scope to do so should allow automatic stabilizers to operate. And some countries with fiscal space, I guess they were thinking about Germany, should go even beyond this. Um, and, and in addition, they were saying that if the central bank was coordinating with the sovereign, then there was even more uh, room for fiscal space. Uh, so this U-turn thesis was in fact uh, accepted by the independent evaluation office of the IMF in their report in 2014. This is exactly what they say. They say, well, okay, the, the IMF in 2008-2009 called for global fiscal stimulus and this was the right thing to do. But then in 2010-2011, the IMF endorsed a shift to consolidation in some of the largest advanced economies, and that was premature. And then they claimed that later, as time progressed, the IMF showed flexibility in uh, giving policy advice and calling for a more moderate pace of fiscal consolidation. consolidation. Uh, and this is exactly the view uh, that uh, Brett Fiebiger and myself uh, put forward in 2017. So uh, we argued that, uh, well, in, in 1997, the, the IMF was really going for fiscal austerity all out. And then it changed completely its view in October 2008. So there was a 150 degree turn of the IMF. But then in uh, in uh, May 2010, um, there was, that's the, um, the green arrow, which is darker. Uh, there was a return towards fiscal austerity, but not as full fiscal austerity as was advocated in, in the end of the 1990s at the time of the Asian crisis. And then there was again, uh, some move, another U-turn towards uh, more fiscal stimulus in at the end of 2012 or early uh, 2013. Um, I said I would say a few things about uh, Clift, Ben Clift. His, I, I was very much annoyed by the paper that he published in the Review of International Political Economy. I don't know if Eileen uh, saw it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, his basic argument is this, is that IMF has really been in the vanguard of a, yeah. a comeback towards Keynesian policy. Uh, so he writes, the IMF was central to bolstering the respectability of the positive views of fiscal policies efficacy we find the Keynesian revival at the fund being both longer in germination and more enduring than some have recognized. So he is criticizing implicitly uh, people who would be saying that, oh, okay, there's been a change around 2008, 2009 with the fiscal, with the, the, the global cri financial crisis of the views of the IMF about fiscal policy. Uh, but uh, arguing that, well, no, that's not true, claiming that even before 2008, there were many people at the IMF and there's, uh, the models were already being changed uh, and so on. And so what we call new fis fiscalism, uh, Clift calls contingent Keynesian approach in, in the sense that the Keynesian approach is good, but on, only under some circumstances. So he claims that there was Keynesian modeling before 2008 at the IMF that included the Ricardian equivalence uh, argument or theory. He said that this was taken away. And, uh, and he, he said, well, they, they added the imperfections. And as I mentioned uh, in an early slide, uh, also included liquidity strapped households. 
uh, households that uh, in order to be spend needed to have income. Wow, big uh, assumption. Um, but when you look at these pre-crash, uh, pre-2008 IMF models, and even afterwards, they still show that fiscal consolidation is beneficial, although it sometimes has short-term uh, negative effects. And uh, in fact, I mean, what this is, I mean, what these models were showing, they were in favor of expansionary austerity, which was the argument made by uh, several Italian economists at the time. And this idea of an austerity that would be expansionary was rejected only in 2012. Um, in, in these pre-crash IMF models, uh, they still showed significant crowding out effects with permanent increases in government debt. So my view about this is the, the one that I summarize on the last line of the slide is that, well, the IMF really was a Johnny come lately as uh, which is the expression that Milton Friedman used against uh, Nicholas Caldor <laughs> when talking about endogenous money. Uh, they were Johnny come lately relative to the academia. I mean, there had been uh, new Keynesian models that were uh, much less in favor of austerity uh, way before they arrived at the IMF. So uh, as I said, I was very much, uh, I got very much annoyed at reading the article by Cliff. Uh, okay, just, uh, I said I was much, uh, I was essentially backward looking. So I'll, I have one slide on the, on the forward looking. Uh, what can we say about the IMF and COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 crisis? I looked at this October 2020 uh, report uh, of the IMF. Uh, they say where fiscal rules may constrain action, their temporary suspension would be warranted, combined with a commitment to a gradual consolidation path after the crisis abates to restore compliance with the rules over the medium run. Room for immediate spending needs could be created by prioritizing crisis countermeasures and reducing wasteful and poorly targeted subsidies. So I would say that the view they have now in 2020 is approximately the one that they defended around 2013. So it's still this question, this is what I said, I said, well, this is equal to the new fiscalism mark two that Brett Fibiger and myself talked along with uh, Mario Sakareccia. And this is, was, this is what this person at the independent assessment office calls new balance. So I would say that since 2013, uh, the, the IMF point of view has not changed that much. I was listening to, uh, yes, I was listening to a webinar uh, of the Independent Assessment Office and somebody there was wondering whether this very nice rhetoric applies to the lending agreements with emerging or development economies. Uh, and so I think this is roughly also uh, the, the fear that Eileen was talking about. Okay, finally, I think we can still say, going besides fiscal policy, that there has been some change at the IMF. As Eileen mentioned, there's been a partial recantation on direct capital controls, the institutional view. Uh, there's been several papers by this guy, Jonathan Ostry, who is a Canadian and happened to take his first year economics class at the University of Ottawa. But that was before I, I got there. <laughs> uh, so there is this idea that inequality may be bad for growth, which is kind of new. Uh, there is also the idea that, okay, once we have high debt because of a crisis, well, just live with, with it and allow debt ratios to decline on their own. 
um, policies of wage repression are counterproductive. Neoliberalism has been oversold. Uh, finally, the DSG models that the IMF have allowed for the possibility of financial crisis in 2014. And from my perspective, as you know, I'm a big fan of monetary economics. There's now, the, there's a couple of working papers from the IMF where they have endogenous money and agent-based modeling. So yes, there is some change at the IMF. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, and this wasn't by design, but we moved from two scholars that influenced me uh, considerably to two scholars that also influenced me, but in a different way, because they have been both my co-authors. So the first of uh, those will be uh, Esteban Perez Caldente from uh, ECLAC. And again, Esteban, I'll give you uh, a five minute and one minute warning. I'll try to put the thing there, but if you don't see it, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly interrupt you. Okay, uh, can, can, can everyone see the, the screen? Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, expansionary fiscal policy in developing countries uh, in the COVID. So I'm going to have a sort of a actual and forward looking view and the role of international financial institutions with a focus on Latin America. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, why is it necessary for developing countries to uh, undertake expansionary fiscal policy? Why is it necessary? What does it entail? What uh, are uh, the uh, interventions uh, that are required by international financial institutions, including the IMF? Uh, um, what have they done so far and what are their limitations? And I'm going to be talking besides a little bit of capital controls about liquidity and debt. And I'm going to be emphasizing that uh, the IMF has insufficient uh, firepower, number one, inelastic liquidity. I think Eileen talked about the SDRs. I'm going to be mentioning also that, that the allocation of existing liquidity is, uh, is uh, unequitable and perhaps inefficient, and that there's a divorce between liquidity and debt. So let me start by uh, quoting, uh, uh, giving you a quote from the director of uh, the IMF, who recently at the Guider Economic Forum, January 14, 15, 2021, says in terms of policy for now, for right now, very unusual for the IMF, I will go out and I would say, please spend spend as much as you can, and then spend a little bit more. And uh, this uh, uh, brings to the question, what brings the question whether fiscal policy is back on the table, counter cyclical fiscal policy. Traditionally, neoclassical economics has relied on, uh, on fiscal policy when monetary policy is insufficient to expand ag aggregate demand, or it hits the lower bound interest rate, and I have there a, uh, a quote from uh, a statement on public works drafted by Chicago economists, 1932, the need for a courageous fiscal policy on the part of the central government. And if you read Frank Knight or our own director, you would have exactly, or uh, Jacob Viner, you would have exactly the same, um, the same type of, of quote. So that's not new. Uh, in uh, the current context, uh, the issue is whether countercyclical fiscal policy is available only to developed countries. And this is perhaps what the World Bank and the IMF say. Uh, if a, it is only available for uh, the uh, developed countries, then that means that developing countries have to wait for developed countries to expand demand and grow through export like growth to take them out of the doldrums. And as things stand, really, developing countries can't wait for developed countries to take them out of the current mastery. This is a graph uh, on the basis of uh, IMF and ECLAC for 2020-2021, showing the rate of growth of GDP for different developing regions and an estimate that I made of the rate of growth of investment. In the case of Latin America, for example, the rate of growth, uh, the decline in the rate of growth is minus 7.7, minus .7, and the decline in the rate of growth is minus 20%. We just can't wait for export or trade to go back to normal. Uh, and the question is, does what does fiscal policy 
entail. This is a uh, computation of a Kalieski multiplier on the basis of uh, parameters estimated for Latin America, uh, where you have the average propensity uh, to save, whether you have the propensity to save from earned income, the propensity to, uh, uh, to import, and the average tax burden. And if you do the exercise for, America, for Latin America, and if you go uh, with the story of the logical multiplier, forget the dynamic multiplier, and everything just goes uh, according to what the logical instantaneous multiplier would be, the multiplier for Latin America is about 1.01. .01. So what does it entail fiscal policy for developing countries? Well, it entails a huge effort. And the fact is that if you do a, the, an exercise, and this is an exercise done with real data for Latin America, it would, it would take a phenomenal amount of increase uh, in terms of government investment and increase of what the share in total investment would have to be to have, let's say, a two point percent uh, uh, rate of growth of GDP given the uh, logical multiplier. And this is part of the locking effects, obviously, of neoliberal policies, because not only is investment a smaller share of GDP, but public investment in Latin America, except for a few countries, is extremely low. It's about one to maximum 2.53% of GDP. And it's difficult with that amount uh, and with the parameters that we have in terms of inequality, in terms of propensity to import, that uh, autonomous demand could play a very important role. The autonomous demand would have to grow around seven or eight percent for a number of years to produce like a six percent real rate of growth. So first of all, it would take a huge effort on the part of domestic policy, but it also would take uh, an important uh, effort on the power on the part of the uh, on the part of uh, IFIs. Uh, and it would take uh, an enormous effort that can be illustrated with these correlations between the uh, risk, sovereign risk index, the rate of growth for some Latin American countries and the nominal exchange rate for Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. And they're all sort of related. So when the, they're in, in uh, Independently of the independently of the correlate of the causality, whether it goes from exchange rate to uh, uh, MB, or whether it goes from the rate of change of sovereign risk to the rate of change of a nominal exchange rate, uh, Latin America Latin American uh, countries have a problem, have an external constraint that is a binding a constraint. And any change, for example, in the, uh, the, uh, 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 the sovereign rate risk index would change automatically the, uh, uh, the rate of nominal rate of exchange in the same direction. And if you have higher risk, you have a depreciation of the exchange rate. That obviously has important uh, implications in terms of uh, balances for the uh, different agents, which has an implication in terms of growth. And so not only uh, fiscal policy requires an important effort on the part of the authorities, it, in, it, in, it also requires a change of view of international financial institutions, including the IMF. Obviously capital controls here are required and I just wanted to mention that what Keynes uh, uh, defended capital controls in volume 25 of the collective works when he talked about capital controls in the current clear currency union rather than speculative flows, he said there was more there was a more fundamental reason and that's to have the freedom to move the uh, exchange rate to have an autonomous uh, monetary policy, but here we could talk also about an autonomous fiscal policy. And the correlations are important, as I said before, because debt has increased substantially in all developing regions. Currently, for example, Latin America has the highest gross debt of the general government as percentage of GDP of all developing regions. And moreover, if you look at the external debt service, external debt service right now, this is estimation, these are estimations from the IMF represent 
of the exports of goods and services, which is huge and which poses an important constraint on the ability of these countries to develop and to have a fiscal policy. One can argue that a fiscal policy in developing countries can, you know, it can uh, have an effect on imports and it can uh, widen the current account, but an important effect is a financial effect in a sense that uh, when countries in Latin America just carry out uh, an expansionary fiscal policy, they're punished by the external sector in terms of higher uh, downgrade uh, credit ratings and higher risk. And that creates all the, uh, the different uh, uh, chains of causality, for example, in terms of exchange rate, in terms of debt, in terms of growth that I pointed to. So what can I, I, uh, international financial institutions such as the IMF do? First of all, they can increase liquidity. But as far as we know, the IMF has a limited firing power. Uh, the IMF uh, states that it has $1 trillion when, it ha when in fact, if you go through the math and you calculate the quotas, the potential borrowing, the lending commitments, the unusable quota resources, it's about between 787 billion and 800 billion in terms of lending. If you do the exercise, just a simple exercise, and you put together what the multilateral development banks uh, can lend, what the regional financial institutions that Eileen uh, uh, Gravel was mentioning can lend, and international monetary funds, it totals to about 1.8 trillion and the uh, uh, needs of developing countries were estimated by the IMF around March 2020 in about 2.7 trillion. So they fall below. And probably right now, if you did the same estima estimation, they will be even higher. So that's a first uh, uh, limitation. It's the insufficient liquidity power. The other limitation, uh, and I think uh, Eileen referred to this, is the uh, minutes, elastic... Seven. Sorry? Sorry? Five, Five minutes? minutes. Okay. The other limitation is the, uh, the inelastic liquidity. The best way to increase liquidity is through an issue of SDRs because SDRs do not create an equivalent debt. It's not like a loan. A new issue of SDRs requires about 85% of the approvals of the IMF and includes that of the United States, which holds 16.5% of the voting power. And if you want to go above, let's say you want to go to, let's say one trillion or two trillions, like was mentioned before, you need the approval of the United States Congress. So even if you have, for example, if you do the hypothetical exercise of let's say 500 billion uh, uh, an issue of SDR of 500 billion and what it would mean for developing regions, let's say for Latin America, it will come up with about 40, uh, 40 billion for Latin America, which if you uh, uh, translate it into dollars as the SDR US exchange rate, it will give you an increase in gross international reserves of only 10%. And so it's very difficult to increase liquidity and, and even an issue of SDRs of 500 billion that would not require the approval of the United States Congress is simply insufficient. The IMF has put uh, at the disposal of developing countries a series of liquidity lines, the rapid financing instrument, the rapid credit facility. Now, when you do the exercise, and you uh, try to compare what the countries receive in terms of what they can receive, which is 100% of their quota through these two instruments, and the financing gap that the IMF says these countries have, they cover about 23 to 32% of countries' financing needs. The only really instrument that can cover 100% of countries' needs is a flexible credit line. But this is granted just to a few countries. It doesn't have a, a cap on IMF resources, but only to those countries that have, so according to the IMF, sound macro fundamentals, which in the case, for example, Latin America, it's Colombia, Peru, and Chile. Mexico has a flexible credit line, but from 2019. So countries, in fact, are, uh, have three choices. 
Even there, they can request funding for multilateral institutions, for example, the World Bank, which is problematic because the World Bank uh, ha uh, has, the, uh, the, uh, has provided some lending, but if you compare with the crisis 2008, 2009, it provided less liquidity to middle income countries than at the time of the crisis. In fact, it has provided more funding to low income countries. So countries in Latin America that are considered middle income countries have a little bit of a problem. You can request an IMF standard program. For example, Costa Rica has done it because Costa Rica has a rapid financial instrument, does not cover covered about 50% of its balance of payments uh, financing needs. So you go into conditionality or adjustment, or you can issue bonds in international capital markets, which countries are doing and countries have done in Latin America. They have very long maturity periods, let's say for 50, even for 100 years, but are rates of interest that are above historical rates of growth. And that really causes a problem because the insufficient liquidity and the inelastic liquidity pushes countries into insolvency and more uh, liquidity constraints. Finally, the last point I wanted to make is regarding liquidity and debt. Liquidity provisions cannot, se cannot be separated from debt reduction efforts. This is a table uh, that shows the projected debt service of countries that are participating in the DSSI initiative of the G20. Uh, the DSSI initiative of the G20 involves basically official bilateral creditors. Uh, private lenders are voluntarily uh, invited to participate, but they are not, uh, it's not compulsory for them to participate nor are official multilateral institutions participating. And when you look at what, uh, in terms of debt service and in terms of debt, the composition of the debt, uh, private lenders and official multilateral lenders have 64 or 50 or more than 50% of the debt that is owed by these countries. And these, these uh, creditors are simply not part of uh, this initiative. This is what I wanted to say. Basically, we, you need to fiscal policy. Fiscal policy will require an enormous effort on the part of at least Latin American countries from the, given their structural features and given what neoliberal and orthodox policies have done in terms of investment and in terms of the share of government investment in the total. You need uh, the IF, uh, uh, international financial institutions and the IMF for the reasons I've put forward, the external constraint and the financial external constraint, but the IF high eyes have insufficient firepower, inelastic liquidity. They allocate resources where resources are not most needed. And there's a clear dichotomy between liquidity and that obviously under, under underlying the decision of the international financial institutions are countries, the G20. So this view, this, these measures also reflect the G20's, uh, G20 countries uh, stance on fiscal policy and on developing countries developments and their possibility to expand aggregate demand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, now we come to uh, the last uh, presentation. So I think Stephen has to stop sharing the screen and, and we'll get uh, Florencia, uh, Florencia Sember's presentation. And again, Florencia, I'll give you uh, the, the five minute uh, and one minute uh, warning. Can you see the presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes we can. Okay. okay, good afternoon to everybody. Matthias, thank you for organizing this. Um, I will be talking um, from the point of view of Argentina. So uh, it's, uh, it's it, what I think is interesting is we, we will be seeing a lot of uh, the things the previous speaker said but applied to a particular case or not applied. <laughs> We will see. Um, 
the first thing that came to my mind was uh, when I saw the title of the roundtable, is there a new IMF? Um, I will address, as I said, the question from the point of view of the relations of the institution to Argentina. Um, has the institution's position regarding Argentina changed? Change. I think there was a, a first opportunity for this change to happen after the crisis of 2001. And I think there is another opportunity now. Was the opportunity of 2001 taken uh, and will the opportunity will be taken now? Um, I can go for my... Um, to answer these questions, we need uh, inevitably to go back in time uh, for a first review of the relationship of Argentina with the IMF. Let me only remind of the highest external vulnerability that the Argentine economy has always shown as the rest of Latin America, as Esteban just said. Uh, the increasing high external vulnerability has meant for Argentina a problem of uh, chronic indebtedness and a series of defaults. Um, in this con it is in this context that we uh, must look or must view the Argentine relationship with the IMF uh, the relationship was controversial from the beginning since Argentina adhered uh, to the institution under uh, a military government. Um, if we take a quick look to the history of, Argentine, of Argentine agreements with the IMF, the first thing that is striking is uh, the quantity of such agreements, all subject to strict conditionalities. Um, of course, I will not go into detail into each one of them. I just want to remember that after the 2001 uh, Argentine economic crisis, uh, with uh, what was at the time the biggest default in history, the relationship with them seemed to have changed. Uh, I will argue this did not happen. In 2006, Argentina paid to the IMF all the outstanding debt and did not accept Article 4 consultations for 10 years. But this changed in 2018 with the Macri government. Uh, what uh, I, I first want to show is that uh, in the first place, uh, that uh, after the significant role the IMF had in the crisis of 2001, the IMF um, didn't seem to change uh, regarding Argentina. The fund received a widespread criticism for its role in the crisis um, and the Independent Evaluation Office uh, issued a report assessing the role of the institution in the genesis of the crisis and in the management during the crisis. The report made a diagnosis of the crisis that was in complete contradiction uh, with the facts and the conclusions were uh, these I, I selected here, that fiscal policy uh, remained weak, uh, that the IMF on its part erred in the pre-crisis period by supporting the country's policies too long, even if, if after it became evident in the late 1990s that the political ability to deliver the necessary fiscal discipline and structural reforms was lacking. And uh, the lack of strong structural conditionality had, conditionality had the unfortunate outcome of obliging the IMF to remain engaged with Argentina when the evident lack of substantive progress and structural reform should have called for an end to the program relationship. But contrary to the, what the IMF stated, um, the fiscal deficit was not uh, the problem of the period. Uh, this, uh, this figure, Matthias, was <laughs> drawn from our, our work. Um, as you can see, the average of the, of the fiscal deficit of the convertibility period was 1.3% uh, uh, of GDP, which is completely reasonable. Uh, the fiscal position only deteriorated due to the reform of the pension system in 1994 and because of the increasing weight of the external debt services, uh, that which were both consequences of the policies encouraged by the, by, uh, the IMF itself. Um, in the second place, it is not true that Argentina did not make the structural reforms uh, asked by the IMF. Uh, in the 90s, the government regularized external trade, advanced massively with privatizations, reformed the pension system, approved flexibilization of the labor market. Uh, it is not the purpose here to address in detail the consequences of these reforms, but let's just take a look to the unemployment rate that resulted from them. Um, so uh, the Independent Evaluation Office report uh, already started with a very doubtful diagnosis of the causes of the, that led to the Argentine crisis. 
And the report also presents some uh, lessons and recommendations that supposedly the IMF had to learn or follow after, after this episode. Um, one is that um, emphasis on country ownership in IMF supported programs can lead to an undesirable outcome if ownership means misguided or excessively weak policies. So I think it's the, the contrary of experimentation, innovation, or permissive multilateralism <laughs> that Alin said. Um, the conclusion of this is that in the future, the IMF has to compel the countries to implement the reforms, the institutions, uh, the institution things are correct through structural uh, conditionality. Uh, then uh, that once the IMF realizes that the road undertaken by a country is not sustainable, the support should be conditional to changes in policy. That medium, medium uh, term exchange rate and debt sustainability should form, form the core focus of IMF surveillance. We will see that this recommendation will not be followed in the future in the Argentine case. And what is surprising is that in the discussion of the executive board on the report, it was cautioned, however, that the applicability of some of the lessons to other crisis situations could be limited, since Argentina is a unique case in many respects. So in reality, all these lessons the IMF supposedly learned are valid only for Argentina, but were they applied, at least in the Argentine case, uh, what I, I want to argue is that no, they were not applied, there was not any change, and uh, this was um, an missed opportunity. Um, if we look at the article for report of 2005, um, the, the, the report was the last one, in ten, then there will, will be no reports for 10 years. Uh, it was uh, the begin. it was not the beginning, but the middle of the first Kirchner government. And um, if we look at the report after the, the article for consultations, we can identify uh, the same inconsistencies as before the 2001 crisis. On the one side, the report draws attention on the weak, to the weak investment environment highlighted by the continuing disputes with the regulated public uh, service companies. They recommend some kind of agreement with these companies so to create an environment favorable to external investments. Uh, they start to include some kind of tariff readjustment or the, of the public services. Uh, in fact, during the Kirchner government, public services were highly regulated, not only with regulated prices, but uh, forbidding, for example, the disconnection of non-paying users, some in the IMF uh, criticized. Um, but at the same time, the report praises the safety net that moved 3.5 million people out of poverty uh, without realizing that, for example, the regulation of the uh, public services they were criticizing were part of that safety net that moved people out of poverty. Um, there was also the recommendation to move to an inflation targeted framework. Um, the, uh, again, appears here the uh, mistaken diagnosis of uh, the genesis of the 2001 crisis. Uh, as stemming from fiscal disorder, which is used to advocate for fiscal authority once again. And um, again, and then the fund underlined at last that the government didn't yet complete the compensation to the banks for asymmetric pesoization and ignored that the banks uh, completely, the report ignores completely that the bank had had a really role in capital flight during the 2001 crisis. So even if they had a lean role in capital flight uh, to the fund, they had to be compensated. Um, so in the end, it seems that beyond some expressions praising, praising the reduction of poverty, uh, the fund was above all advocating for a favorable environment for foreign investment, the profitability of the banking sector, and to avoid an excessive state intervention in the economy. So there was not, no change at all. In 2006, President Kirchner paid all the outstanding debt to the institution and denied future article for missions. Um, after 10 years of uh, broken relations with the IMF, um, Macri comes to government in 2016, and uh, in 2018, he will resort to the IMF for help, for support. Um, as soon as the new government began, um, a whole series of policy changes were implemented. To summarize the most important world elimination of exchange controls, the devaluation of the currency of 40% only a few hours after the government took office, liberalization of capital movements, agreement with the welfare funds, and huge increases in the tariff of public services. These policies were welcomed by the fund, 
in the report of um, 2016, uh, again in the article for consultation, uh, which was the far, first one in 10 years, they praised the transition to what they called a better economic policy and uh, stated that the aim of the report was focused on the best way to obtain sustained and equitable growth. Um, the main positive aspects underlined were the elimination of exchange controls, the increase in public service tariffs, the settlement with the view to future funds, okay, five minutes, um, and the announcements of inflation targets and fiscal targets. So in 2016, there was still the same contradiction of stating the intention of protecting the most vulnerable population and at the same time praising policies in contradiction with this goal, like increasing the tariffs of public services. Um, the main problem with, with the, the Macri government will be uh, to maintain exchange rate stability in a context of rising inflation and capital flight. Uh, the solution was envisaged in the arrangement with the Vulture Fund and amnesty uh, to capital head abroad, abroad and above all external indebtedness and the resort to carry trade. Carry trade was performed through use of the central bank called Levac uh, with a high yield in Argentine pesos. The amount of Levac increased by 56% between the Macri government to office and uh, the exchange crisis of May 2018. In an attempt to stop speculation, the government tried to lower the interest rate of Levac at the end of 2017 and introduced a tax on financial profits. This led to investors to dollarize their portfolios and leave the country. The central bank lost reserve for $6 billion in a few months, and in May 4th, the peso devaluated 9% of 2018. Four days later, macro government initiated talks with the IMF. Um, Argentina reached an agreement in June 2018. Um, the MF agreement had the aim of finan to finance gradualism in the implementation of the reforms and to soften the impact on the vulnerable population. As I think at this point, everybody knows this agreement was the biggest in the history of the IMF. It amounted to 56 billion, of which only, uh, only, I don't know if only, but of, of which 44 billion were uh, withdrawn. After Argentina didn't comply with the conditionalities, the MF agreement had very, very soon to be renegotiated. Uh, some changes were introduced in October 2018 and again in July 2019. Uh, and very important, some disbursements initially planned for 2020 were anticipated to 2019. That fact was interpreted by many as an attempt to finance the macro re-election since 2019 was an election year. In October, Macri lost the elections and in a mission of February 2020, uh, the IMF concluded that Argentina's debt and debt service capacity have deteriorated decidedly compared to the IMF last debt sustainability analysis. On that occasion, the overall assessment was that Argentina public debt was sustainable, but not with high probability. IMF staff now assesses Argentine debt to be unsustainable. Um, if we look at the behavior of the debt, what is striking is that even before the fund declared that the um, uh, if you pay attention to uh, debt sustainability after the 2001 crisis, in the months before the Argentine agreement with the IMF, the uh, debt had already increased significantly. However, the fund uh, signed this agreement without a detailed analysis of the situation. After that, the fund accumulated and so the capital flight. And especially after the agreement, uh, exchanges were, exchange rates were very unstable. Um, if we compare the laudatory declarations of the Article 4 consultations uh, in 2016 with what actually happened after uh, the measures were applied, we find a complete contradiction. Uh, this is the supposed stability of the exchange rate that was significantly after the IMF agreement. Um, these are the so uh, priced, uh, increase in prices of the tariffs of public services. This is the city of Buenos Aires. And uh, there is not a mistake. These uh, figures, 4,000, 3,000 that you see in the index numbers are right. These were the public uh, tariff increases during the Macri government in the city of Buenos Aires. Um, not too difficult to imagine the effect on the protection of the poor the IMF was uh, supposedly <laughs> talking about. Um, this is the relation of the actual inflation rate uh, with the inflation rate uh, targeted by the central bank at the, at the beginning of the period. 
um, the status were already eliminated in the first revision of the agreement. Um, and finally, we can see uh, how um, the attempts to protect the poor uh, result. This is the relation of minimum wage to basic consumption basket. This is uh, how uh, the protection of the poor resulted <laughs> after the, the, the IMF uh, agreement. Um, so uh, all this shows that at least in regard, oops, one minute. To Argentina, the IMF didn't seem to change uh, and, and until 2019, um, even if it was expectable some change after the widespread criticism after the 2001 crisis, the opportunity uh, of a change uh, it was missed. So what is the current situation? What was, can we expect uh, uh, with the pandemic? Uh, and with this, I will, I will finish. Um, during the pandemic, the IMF made a series of general declarations regarding the need of government interventions to address the consequences of the pandemic and foster future recovery. In Argentina, the pandemic began only three months after the change in government and just after the fund declared that Argentine debt to be unsustainable. For this reason, the new government didn't withdraw the, the remaining 11 billion uh, of the agreement, but focus on uh, the renegotiation of uh, the payment of the already contracted debt. Um, in this statement of February 2020, besides declaring the unsustainability of the debt, the fund recognized that the primary surplus that would be needed to reduce public debt and gross financing needs to levels consistency, consistent with manageable rollover risk and satisfactory potential growth is not economically nor politically feasible. These declarations as for the contribution of private creditors to help restoring debt sustainability. With the support of the fund, um, Argentina reached in August 2020 uh, an agreement with private creditors to restructure debt. Um, at this moment, uh, Argentina is trying to reach an agreement with the fund before May, when a payment to the Paris Club is scheduled. Argentina asked for an extended fund facility program, which is negotiating uh, now and is negotiating the conditions. Uh, Argentina vote may ask not to make repayments until 2024, while the original agreement had scheduled important payments in the following, in 2022 and 23, uh, which are impossible to face after the consequences of the pandemic. The GDP fell 10.5% last year, and the increase in unemployment was also important. Uh, besides the fiscal effort, uh, of the Argentine government policies to fight the pandemic was much lower than in other Latin American countries with a similar impact of the pandemic. Um, so uh, to conclude, um, what can we expect? Is there a new IMF? So uh, I tried to show that uh, until 2019, uh, the answer was no. I think regarding Argentina, there was no uh, new IMF, uh, but can we expect a change now? Some positive signs are the support to the negotiation with private creditors and the admission that Argentina cannot commit to, to fiscal austerity in the current conditions. But is the IMF going to make a contribution to? Will the new agreement conditionalities reflect the new ideas or will, like the previous time, these declarations come to nothing once the agreement is put into paper? As Mark said before, uh, what will happen when effectively the agreement is, is uh, written? Uh, we'll have to wait until the outcome of the negotiations in place to begin to provide an answer, but uh, there might be an opportunity here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florencia. And with this, we, we conclude uh, the presentations. We'll open up for questions. We have a, a few questions, so I'm going to read them. Uh, let me just briefly say the following thing. I think it's important to acknowledge, as I, I wanted to say something at the beginning of, of the difference between the plan of what the IMF was supposed to be and the actual uh, you know, um, institutional evolution of, of the IMF. And that, that has to be you know, sort of taken into consideration that they were not exactly the same thing. One of the things that in, in one reply that, you know, I'll, I'll read the questions. And so, so uh, you know, that will allow, and, and please continue putting questions, was raised there the question of uh, the ambiguities that, you know, sort of Eileen and, and Mark uh, suggested are, are part uh, of the IMF. 
uh, she, she referred to the use of the term hypocrisy. And I used in that, uh, that paper that Mark cites the, the term organized hypocrisy uh, to, to reflect that. And that reflects also the differences between uh, the uh, research department and, and what uh, very often the operational department uh, does. But I think it, 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 it seems to me uh, or maybe I'm wrong, that uh, Latin Americans, uh, given the panel, tend to be slightly more skeptical about the changes at the IMF. Certainly Argentinians seem to be more skeptical about the changes at the IMF than, uh, than non-Argentinians. So um, without further ado, let me read some of the questions. There, there are at least uh, five questions that I, I've seen. There's a last one by Daniela Prates. So I'm going to um, try to read those. Um, as I, I go alone, I, I tried to write them down, but I think they were panning out. So the first uh, from Fernando Ferrari, uh, uh, and I think it's for everybody, it, it, it might have been sort of, a, uh, in a sense, uh, thought for, um, I, I don't know, uh, for um, Mark, it, it seemed to me at some point, but you know, uh, and you know, it, 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 the question is, so I'll pose it to, to Eileen had to leave, you might have seen in the, in the in the comments that, but um, uh, do you think IMF change in fiscal policy? Assuming there is a change, uh, and and uh, do you think that the change in fiscal policy would really lead to prosperity? So, so that that's one question. There is something to that effect also in the question of Ozer uh, Mustafa, uh, although he goes more into the uh, the programs uh, that you know are, are relevant. Uh, and uh, I wanted to magnify this, but I'm for some reason not being allowed to do that. Uh, perhaps if I take off participant. Oh, there you go. Uh, and I can read them directly from here, which is uh, sort of better. Pardon me. Um, um, so uh, that's one question. Then we had two questions from uh, Aida Garcia. Uh, what for Mark, uh, what elements uh, one uh, needed uh, to uh, you know, include, I suppose, in the new DSG and agent-based models uh, to make uh, them acceptable. There is another one that she posed uh, to um, Eileen uh, on what would be the relevance of MMT, but uh, and, you know, ideas related to uh, fiscal policy in developing countries. I think that, that uh, I'll, I'll open that one to uh, the three of you. So I think that that's uh, perfectly all right. Uh, also, Fadil asked about uh, Mark's uh, views of fiscal policy. I suppose we can sort of think of those and how those uh, sort of connect to uh, to um, to some of the issues uh, that we discussed with the IMF. I, I you know, um, uh, Eileen did suggest to go look at the book by uh, uh, you know uh, James O'Connor uh, on the fiscal crisis of the state. I should suggest that you'll be surprised. You know, it's sort of relatively fiscally conservative. So uh, that particular book. So I don't think all Marxists necessarily agree with that book. <laughs> I would hope not. Uh, Jean-François Ponceau asked uh, a question for Eileen, uh, Mark, and Esteban. I think this, this is valid for, 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 I'm going to extend it to Florencia too. Uh, uh, how would you explain the IMF schizophrenia? And that's the one that she responded with hypocrisy. On the one hand, the IMF advocates new fiscalism, while on the other hand, it imposes austerity policies on developing countries. So, so um, there is that sort of element. Um, uh, Wait, wait, uh, there is one more, I think. Uh, um, here, Daniela Price. Uh, so uh, complementing uh, Jean-Francois's question, um, do you have more detailed information about the current conditionalities of the IMF programs? For what I know, the same austerity policies have been imposed but it would be useful to have more information about the current 21 programs linked to ex post conditionalities. Uh, other six programs are without these conditionalities, uh, four fle flexible credit lines uh, that Stephen mentioned and two rapid financing uh, instruments. And um, we have uh, Mark just said goodbye. So uh, let, let's keep those. I think I have four or five questions. So if, if you go, uh, you know, again, uh, now would be Mark first, then Stephen, then Florencia, uh, and I'll continue reading here the questions and, and try to pose a, a few more. Okay, I, I don't think I can uh, answer all the questions, uh, and there are people who know more about than me about these. 
Um, so I'll answer to the question about the SG models and their improvement. Uh, and uh, I would say, no, there's nothing you can do with these. Uh, I would say the foundations of these models are completely unrealistic and fragile. And so it's not by adding uh, realistic uh, floors to these models that you will make them uh, more realistic or less fragile. And this is recognized also by uh, many mainstream uh, economists. It's not, it's not just a, a position of heterodox economists. Uh, I can say something also about the first question by Jean-Francois Ponceau. Why is, it, uh, why is it that the IMF looks schizophrenic? I, I think the answer is in the fiscal space idea. So the idea is that, well, all these developed countries, uh, Canada, uh, Australia, whatever, uh, they have more fiscal space from the standpoint of the IMF, whereas you know countries uh, that are uh, emerging and so on, they would have apparently less fiscal space, even if their debt ratio is much lower than in some other countries like Japan or the U.S. So I'll. Uh, Okay, and there was a question on the chat about what is that IMF paper with endogenous money that I cite. Please just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you the, the link or the paper. Thank you. Sorry, I missed that, that question about the IMF uh, and endogenous money. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Stephen. Uh, regarding the IMF changes in fiscal policy, the I think... Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that we have to to consider is when the IMF talks about, and I cited the uh, director of the IMF about spend more. Uh, it seems to me that she's referring to developed countries, not to developing countries, and that's why I asked my other question: What if we just uh, in developing countries start to spend? What it would take? And in that sense, I don't think there's a lot of changes towards developing countries uh, from the IMF. There is some change in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the type of support provided to uh, developing countries. Uh, I think with the, the crisis, there has been sort of more external support and less uh, maybe uh, demand for countries to adjust because supposedly this is a, uh, a, a, a you know exceptional circumstance. Uh, but on the other hand, in the 2008 2009 crisis, um, you know that was less uh, systemic, I think, than perhaps than the than the pandemic. Uh, uh, the there was a special issue of uh, a new issue of SDRs. And which has not happened in this uh, in this crisis. So in that sense, the, there is less international support. The final thing I wanted to say is that at the IMF, uh, if there is something uh, positive about the support they've provided, the insufficient support provided to developing countries, is that it comes with limited or no conditionality, and those are the rapid financing instruments and the, and the flexible credit line, well, that's available to a few countries, but the other, the rapid credit line, the rapid financing instruments, they come with little, uh, very limited or no conditionality. And that, that's an improvement. And, but as I said before, they're not uh, sufficient. Regarding the MMT and the changes in developing country uh, the, and, and uh, any application to developing countries, all I want to say, and this has to do also with the, the, what I mentioned regarding the external constraint, is that there is in the international monetary system a hierarchy of, of currencies, and the dollar really has the, it's the reserve currency in the world, and it has increased its importance in developing in, uh, in, uh, in the world. Uh, the hierarchy of country, the hierarchy of currency means that it's very difficult to, to uh, undertake arbitrage, actually, and to hedge financial positions. And then if you look 
uh, into, for example, uh, the balance sheet of firms, you see that there's a lot of mismatch of currency. There are the liabilities in um, of external, uh, you know, their external liabilities exceed their internal liabilities. So they're, they're really, uh, uh, they're really uh, uh, vulnerable to any change in the exchange rate that they make that it may come, let's say, because their uh, outf uh, capital outflows or because there is an increase in uh, in risk. And I think that's an important uh, factor to take uh, to take into account. The last uh, uh, thing I wanted to say for Daniela Prates, Oxfam published uh, uh, has a website where you will find per country. Uh, the type of conditionality they uh, uh, they agreed uh, on um, before uh, no during the pandemic. So you would have there most of the information per country. That's all. Thank you. Great. That's unmute. Um, okay. I will. Uh... Uh, say that uh, about uh, the schizophrenia and the MF, the, <laughs> there may be several explanations um, and uh, even more for the Argentine case. Um, I think um, on the one side, there might be uh, different views in different uh, sections of the MF. For example, uh, the working papers, the people writing the working papers may have, may have a more freedom to to say some things that will never be said by a managing director uh, or that will never be applied to an agreement. Um, also, I think that um, in the case of Argentina, uh, as the AMF said themselves, they consider it a unique case. So what uh, they what might be uh, promoting or the policies they might be uh, promoting or advising to other countries for them might not be adequate uh, to Argentina. And um, also I think uh, there are double standards uh, uh, between what might be allowed to, to developed countries or to developed countries. Uh, and I think uh, in the Argentine case for one reason or another, uh, until now uh, the, the the, the IMF always uh, imposed uh, fiscal austerity and we will see what happens now with the new agreement, but uh, until now we can say uh, for the moment. Thank you. Uh, I have, uh, there are a couple more if, if you want to give a, a little twist they're not particularly sort of very different uh, uh, than then Diana Tusi asked us, um, you know, well, th there are all of these differences and we have, and I think Mark, to some extent by saying, you know, the four views, you know, there is no change, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, uh, some change perhaps with U-turns and, and twists and turns. Uh, there is a, you know, some sort of uh, organized uh, incoherence uh, in, in their views for many different reasons. And eventually they were leading the, you know, the, the charge on changes, which I think it's very hard to defend, but you know, uh, uh, the, the question is what are the differences in the panel? And, and I'll leave that for my, my conclusion to say something about that. What I think, I think that there are lesser, you know, divisions within the panel that it might seem in my view. So after all, I am a moderator uh, for once. And, and uh, I'm rarely the moderator or moderate, but, uh, but uh, and the other question was, uh, let me uh, hear by uh, Noor. Uh, she asked, uh, I was wondering about the panelist positions on, on uh, you know, th this particular issue. Th does the IMF support stimulus represent a permanent shift or a temporary respond uh, to the crisis? And I think this is an important question because uh, I think Mark brought uh, Larry Summers, perhaps it was Eileen, I don't remember now, uh, but you know, Larry Summers has changed his views on fiscal policy and it's worth remembering that they, you know, and, 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 and Blanchard was a key author of, of uh, expan you know, expan you know, expansionary contractions and, and so on and so forth. So it's worth thinking whether this is temporary, e even at the level, um, you know, that we're discussing here that, you know, that might be backs and forth and whatnot, you know, but, uh, and that they are non-monolithic in their views at the, at the uh, IMF. 
uh, whether this is something that is just for this particular crisis. So, so um, I'll, I'll give you that. And if you guys want uh, a last sort of general comment, if you want, uh, and then probably we will, uh, as, as we continue here, the numbers are dwindling. So we probably should should uh, sort of cancel. So I'll, I'll give you like three minutes each to, to sort of respond or, or make a final comments. Uh, well, I, <laughs> uh, not, not much to say. I mean, you, you, you summarized the views uh, about Larry Summers. Uh, I would say, yeah, he keeps changing his mind. Uh, and, but he's moving more and more towards the argument that the current problems are due to a lack of aggregate demand. He, he even and, cited uh, Tom Paley and said post Keynes exactly. have talked about this for a long while. So, Yeah. Uh, Summers in the early 1980s was talking about hysteresis. Uh, then the notion of hysteresis completely disappeared from the IMF radar or from uh, anybody's radar. And then in 2012, it came back. Uh, it came back hysteresis was there only when things were going bad, when things were going wrong. And now we see that some people are arguing that there could be hysteresis when things are going really well, that this could lead to an increase, uh, say, in the rate of growth of the economy, uh, in the, natu the so-called natural rate of growth of the economy. So yes, people are changing their mind, uh, but I, I don't have a clue whether this is a temporary situation or a permanent one. I'll stop here. Thank you, Mark. Steven. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I don't have much to say, just in terms of, uh, of uh, whether it's permanent or whether there are permanent changes or whether there are uh, they're, they're transitory. It seems that at least in terms of the emergency lines that have no conditionality or limited conditionality, they're called emergency lines. They're, they're transitory. And in general, if you look at the document I mentioned by Oxfam about uh, in general, the countries, uh, most countries uh, have uh, this idea that after the pandemic, they will return back to a, a fiscal consolidation, which in fact means basically fiscal austerity. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I agree with Esteban uh, in the fact that uh, these emergency lines are emergency lines and um, um, we will, I think the best way to know uh, if these uh, changes are uh, permanent or maybe not permanent, but at least uh, uh, with enduring the medium term is to see uh, um, the agreements the IMF uh, signs with the countries because there is what we see uh, beyond all the expressions and declarations and the press declarations of the of the officials uh, the place where we can see if uh, the fiscal austerity is demanded to countries or not is in the agreements so I think uh, it's uh, it's easy to see there. We have just to, to, to see the next agreements, not only with Argentina, but with the rest of the countries. And there we will, we will see uh, what is demanded from them, what are the conditionalities, and we will have a, a partial at least answer to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, to everybody. Uh, let me just say that what, what I sort of tease, and you know, as Mark said, I, to some extent I did try to summarize, but I, I think that the differences uh, that, that, that might seem, you know, uh, in part when, when you look at the, uh, at the panel, uh, uh, which I guess not by design, we ended up having uh, something that goes uh, in reverse of what, uh, we didn't have any fanatic that thought that the, the IMF was at the head of the, of the changes, but we did move from, from uh, positions in, uh, from incoherence to U-turns to more skeptical and eventually to no change in the case of Argentina. So we did move in reverse. And uh, I'm somewhat glad that uh, we ended up with uh, something that is closer to, to my view in that respect. So I, I didn't do it by, I promise it was uh, alphabetical order that I had Florencia at the end. So, um, 
But I think that the differences are smaller than one tends to think. I think that we, we shared here a common preoccupation that if the IMF is going to intervene and do something different, it has to be thought from a different theoretical framework. And that that theoretical framework has uh, you know, been tweaked, uh, but not fundamentally changed. And that those fundamental changes are still uh, you know, uh, to happen if, if, you know, uh, within the profession. I think we all agree that the two last crises have shaken uh, the faith of the public in uh, the ability of economists in general and the institutions that represent us uh, in many ways in policymaking uh, to um, you know, make the changes necessary to make uh, the system work uh, reasonably well. So I think that those 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 are the uh, sort of uh, things that I, I think we all uh, tend to agree. So so that there might be minor differences on on how one sees uh, the forest and you know, the trees. So how much emphasis one puts on continuity versus how much emphasis one puts on on, on um, you know, uh, differences and also how much emphasis one puts on the theoretical discussion uh, in the theoretical department and, and what happens at uh, the operational level in particular countries like uh, say uh, Argentina. So um, I, I also, you know, something that we didn't explore but I think it's sort of relevant is the issue that uh, the IMF, there was a try to reform the IMF and have more voice for developing countries. And we do have, and it's something that's staying with us, the changes in uh, the, Esteban did speak explicitly now in, in the last you know, round about the hegemonic position of the dollar. And you have to remember that the IMF is created and put in place at the time that uh, dollar supremacy is also implemented uh, on a global basis. And that has not changed, but there is a challenge from China and, and that did not appear. Uh, and China tried to, and I should say in, in, the, in the face of the Asian crisis, there was a sort of a discussion of an Asian IMF and many of you may remember that obviously was vetoed by the United States. Uh, so uh, all of those issues are open. This certainly will not finish here. Uh, this hopefully will be a good debate uh, for us to continue. We will, uh, I will post this on the um, uh, Facebook page of the Review of Keynesian Economics. Uh, it will be also linked uh, to the blog uh, Naked Keynesianism. And I want to leave you all with one reminder. I don't have the precise date. I should have by now, but I, I, in Latin American uh, disorganized fashion, I, I, I didn't check the precise date, but there is, I think it's a Saturday, the last Saturday of February or the first Saturday of March. Uh, uh, Mark uh, uh, will uh, give the, the fourth uh, uh, Godley uh, Tobin lecture. And we're very happy. He's one of the, uh, you know, godly. Uh, we're we're trying to get, I should say, at the beginning, all of the co-authors of uh, of um, godly and Tobin uh, to to uh, give the the lectures, uh, so that there is an explicit continuity with that. And that is sponsored also by the Review of Keynesian Economics. And and I will post more information about all of those things. So thank you very much to everybody, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.